for the past several months, we've been studying what the scriptures teach about our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ as believers. And although the Apostle Paul doesn't actually use the term our identification with Christ, um, or he doesn't meant use the term our living union with Christ. Those are terms that we, uh, to, in order to describe the doctrine or the process that takes place, uh, we use those terms to refer to that which Paul does have a lot to say about how God saves all believers by spiritually joining us with the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a lot of passages that, that use the term in Christ. Uh, in Paul's epistles. That identification together with the Lord Jesus Christ is the subject that Paul uh, is given, inspired by God, to write about in almost all his epistles and throughout his epistles. And it's part of the revelation about the Lord Jesus Christ and how, what he accomplished on the cross that was revealed through the Apostle Paul. Uh, that it wasn't until after the cross that, that it's been revealed. Go to Galatians chapter 2. Uh, the verse that, that a lot of believers have memorized and, and quote this verse uh, having to do with our, our identification together with Christ is Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. Uh, in that verse, it sums it up in, when Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Uh, he goes on to say, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Then why did he come if righteousness was by the law? So, of course, in the book of Galatians, Paul uh, is dealing with that idea that uh, the only way uh, that the Judaizers from the prior program were coming around behind Paul trying to convince everyone that they couldn't be saved if they weren't circumcised or under the law. And, but they missed, they stumbled at the stumbling stone. They didn't understand what the law had to say about the Lord Jesus Christ and that they needed to have him as their hope to make them righteous where the law demonstrated or should have demonstrated that a person can't be made righteous by keeping the law, by self-discipline or, or whatever process they try to submit to the law. The law should prove to them as a schoolmaster that they're sinners who need God to make them righteous. So here it is, uh, you know, the verse that Paul uses to explain how it is God makes us righteous is by being identified together with the Lord Jesus Christ. So God's plan of redemption was formed before God created Adam and Eve with a free will. And God planned to justify or make believers righteous. His plan wasn't fully revealed, of course, until after the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We learn about the details about how it is by Christ going to the cross, that God is able to identify believers with Christ and in Christ have redemption through his blood, have, be justified, declared righteous, have God's Christ's righteousness imputed to us, have our sins imputed to him through his cross work. So that, all that information was in the mind of God before the foundation of the world, but it wasn't revealed to us in God's word or wasn't revealed to Israel in, in his word in time past until after the cross it was revealed by God through Paul and in the Hebrew epistles uh, we get more information. Of course the Lord gave us some more information in his earthly ministry as well. So we call this gradual unfolding of God's redemptive plan progressive revelation, don't we? Progressive revelation. That means until God reveals it in his word, we can't expect the, the people who lived before it was revealed to understand those things. But after it's revealed, then we have the information he's progressively revealed that we put together and get a picture that God has for us at that point in the scriptures. And of course, with the information we have about the cross that we understand that was revealed through Paul for us and for the world today, uh, about justifi justification by grace through faith, we now know how God's purpose, plan of redemption unfolds and that God 
gave types and shadows of these things in time past, but, and they didn't understand what those types and shadows meant when they practiced them, and God gave them to be practiced by the nation of Israel. But now we can look back on many of those signs and, and those shadows and types and understand them in the light of the revelation, the full revelation that we have uh, through Christ and after the cross through Paul we have the completed Word of God. So uh, we, with the revelation that we have, can fully understand God's intent uh, through the ages, and He gives us those signs and those types and shadows to let us know He had those things in mind back then, as, you know, of course, as part of His redemptive plan. Now, in Colossians chapter 2, uh, one of those things, types and shadows, that we now realize with the revelation that we have from the Apostle Paul is the doctrine of circumcision. Okay, and that's, that's why, again, uh, we're talking about our circumcision with Christ this morning. And Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. As ye therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. So the what Paul's about to tell us is that there's some understanding about what was accomplished by God when we were saved that we keep in mind and that we access by faith in our walk as believers. This is information you don't need to know to be saved, but this is information after you're saved you need to know in order to be established, to grow uh, in the doctrine of God's grace uh, and how to access by faith the grace God's given us to walk in. Now if we begin in ver or we pick up again in verse 7, how is it, uh, Paul, that we're to uh, walk in Him? Verse 7, rooted and built up in Him. Notice, in Him. And established where? How are we established? In the faith. Now that term, the faith, is used by the Apostle Paul over and over, and it, he uses that term to describe the doctrine God's revealed through him for us to access by faith and walk in. So while all scripture is given by inspiration of God, <clears throat> when you see Paul use the term, the faith, it's, it's relevant to the doctrine revealed for the church today, the body of Christ that we receive through God through Paul. We're established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So, uh, that really is the whole of the Christian life, is learning who and what God's made us in Christ, and what God has made us in Him, be established in that doctrine, stabilize, bring stability to our life, helps us to be mature believers. As we're taught, we got the revelation, Romans through Philemon, uh, the completed Word of God, we, with that revelation, uh, and we're abounding in those things. Now, God does a lot, reveals a lot of information to us in Paul's epistles about the blessings that we have in Christ, uh, including, uh, in this passage, he goes on to say, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So, when anything, when you're in Christ, what are you also in? You're in the Father, you're in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the fullness of the Godhead is resident in each member of the Godhead. They're, they're uh, three persons, but they're one God. And that's the, the doctrine of the Godhead or the Trinity. Uh, now he goes on to say, verse 10, And ye are what? We're complete in Him, in Christ. As believers, when we trust Christ died to pay for our sins, God the Holy Spirit sees that faith. Uh, in, in Ephesians chapter 1.13, uh, the verse is that in whom, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, ye also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So God the Holy Spirit places us in Christ. And uh, so the admonition, as you've received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. The way you received Him was you trusted that He died for your sins. The way you're to walk in Him is to understand what God's made you in Christ and then access that by faith and walk in that truth. He, he says again, verse 10, And ye are complete in Him, in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom... This is something that you are in Christ. Uh, verse 11, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off 
goes on to explain, in putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So we uh, read this passage last week and, and we said that that circumcision doesn't, that's not a reference to when he was eight days old, when after his, his uh, incarnation, after he was born in a body of flesh, um, that doesn't mean that that circumcision, but he's talking about another circumcision that Christ experienced in his life. Uh, verse 12, buried with him in baptism. There, there's your clue. He's talking about the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we're identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. We're also buried with him uh, in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision, that's the, the condition you were in before you trusted the gospel, you were in the uncircumcision of your flesh before, before being saved. He's, he hath quickened together with him, made us alive in Christ, with Christ, being forgi uh, having forgiven you all trespasses. It's blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary to us and took them out, out of the way, nailing them to his cross. So this passage, of course, is talking about our identification with Christ on the cross, being crucified together with Christ, where we're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh. Okay? Now, what that's a reference to, of course, is in Christ, God has circumcised us by cutting our flesh away from our spiritual nature. And, and that's a spiritual uh, work that God performs upon us when we're saved. We're different after we've trusted the gospel because we're new creatures in Christ. Having been separated from that sin nature, God the Holy Spirit indwells our spiritual nature. And we're made one with Christ, and that is salvation. When the Spirit sees our faith in the gospel by joining us, placing us in living union with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're identified. Everything that happened with Christ on the cross is God the Father sees us under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father sees when Christ died on the cross, he sees us nailed to the cross with him. So in Christ, he sees us having died with him, buried with him, and raised with him. He sees us in Christ's resurrection life, identified with Christ. That's why the scriptures in Ephesians 2, for example, say that we're seated with Christ right now in the heavenly places. We're down here, but our spirit is joined with him, and that's where his presence is manifested right now, is in the heavenly places, uh, seated at the right hand of the Father. And we're seated there with him because we're in Christ. God sees us under Christ's perfect righteousness. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 30. We're going to take a quick look at this doctrine of circumcision and see why the term was used, circumcision there, about our identification with Christ when he put off his body of flesh. Deuteronomy chapter 30 is the second giving of the law just before the nation of Israel goes. Uh, Joshua leads Israel into the promised land and uh, Moses is, is about to go up in the mountains and, and die. And, but just before that, he gives this second giving of the law to the nation of Israel. <laughs> and in Deuteronomy chapter th uh, 30, uh, begin reading with me in verse 1. And it shall come to pass when all these things are come, up, come upon thee, the blessing and the curse which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. So when the Lord thy God, or when God drives the nation of Israel out of their promised possession of the land, and he does that through several major uh, uh, events by Israel's enemies coming in, defeating them in battle, and then ultimately taking them, all 12 tribes are carried out of their uh, inheritance, the land they possessed, uh, by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the southern two tribes, the, the remaining two tribes that are occupying the land are taken away. And 
God reveals when he gives the law through Moses to Israel that under the law, if they fail to obey God, and if they worship the gods of, of the nations, that God in his foreknowledge knows what's going to happen. If they do, God tells Israel, if you disobey me, don't hearken to me, you worship other gods instead of making me your one and only God, then these curses are going to come, come upon you in chapters Deuteronomy chapter 28, it goes into great detail. Uh, in Leviticus 26, there's a lot more detail about the judgments of God that will come upon Israel because of their disobedience, their unbelief, uh, refusal to submit to God's word. This is when this verse comes to play. After you're carried out of the land, he tells them, uh, when all these things are come upon thee, the blessings and the curse, which I've set before you, thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee. Now look at um, verse 2. And shalt return unto the Lord thy God, and shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children with all thine, ha with all thine heart, and with all thine soul. So that's a term of faith that's used over and over in the Old Testament to make reference to the faith that Israel was to have in God and trust in him in time past, to trust in his word. Uh, if you drop down to uh, verse 6 now. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. So that's, God is going to perform a work upon them, and this is a reference to a new covenant that God is making with them. This is what God's going to do for them when they utterly fail under their ability to hold their end of a covenant up under the law program. They forsake God. They don't want any part of God. They're under all his curses. God takes the believers in Israel. Now this is talking to the believing remnant that sees their condition under all the judgment that they're under being carried out of their inheritance. And, and they come to their senses. They repent. They change their mind about what they've been doing, living, uh, worshiping other gods, and they, they realize God said, Jehovah said, this would happen to us as his people if we rejected him. We did reject him, and he did exactly what he said he was going to do. Our enemies have carried us out of uh, the inheritance he gave us. We're going to trust in him. And we're going to submit to him as the God who knew before, ahead of time, what was going to happen and what curses he was going to give us. He did exactly according to his word. So they're trusting in God now. And it says when God sees their faith in him to trust in him, then God is going to circumcise their heart and the heart of their seed to love him with all their heart, with all their soul, that they may as what? that they may live. So, you know, there's a lot of references to their faith in God, that they may live, choose, choose life or death. You remember when that uh, option was given to them by Joshua? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is to choose life, is for them to trust in God. And God circumcises, now the point being here, we've looked at how in Christ we're circumcised with a circumcision made without hands that takes place by our identification with Christ on the cross. God promises the nation of Israel that under the new covenant, he's going to circumcise their heart. Now the issue is the heart. The focus here is on the heart. And that's a reference to, uh, to making them have to love the Lord with all their heart, mind, and soul is a reference to God making them righteous, God making them able to, uh, to walk in His will, and, and it also circumcision of the heart has to do with the faith of their heart to trust in God and to trust in Him only. So we're going to look at the references to circumcision of the heart and, and we'll see how through the Word, again, through progressive revelation, it's revealed what this new covenant is going to pertain to is God making Israel righteous by His Spirit, joining them with His Spirit, right? Through them basically being identified together with their Messiah's death, burial, and resurrection and Israel being made righteous in Christ.
Now, they don't have that full understanding back here. It's just glimpses and shadows and types of what God's going to perform that isn't revealed to us until it's revealed through Paul's revelation and for the nation of Israel specifically in the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> so again, the, the issue is with the heart. God is going to circumcise Israel's heart under the new covenant. Now that takes us back to God's unconditional covenant, the Abrahamic covenant that he, that he makes with Abraham. And the sign of that covenant, circumcision, and what it was meant to imply when God takes the sign of circumcision and attaches that to his unconditional covenant with Abraham. What is the circumcision of male children in the nation of Israel have to do with the circumcision of the heart uh, and what does that have to do with the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ? What did 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 say to us about our identification with Christ? For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So through the cross, God makes the Lord Jesus Christ, takes our sin and puts it on his son. And then God pours his wrath out. God the Father pours his wrath out against sin upon his own son as he's on the altar of Calvary. He's the sacrifice that atones or pays for the sins of all men, right? That's the circumcision that takes place there has to do with God t dealing with the sin problem. And so the circumcision that God uh, gives to Abraham as a sign uh, of the covenant he made with him has to do with God making a Abraham righteous when Abraham believed God. Uh, the verse says um, in uh, Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, uh, well, God says he brought Abraham forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell me, tell me or and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Now at this point, Abraham didn't have an heir. He didn't have a child. God takes him out. He shows him the stars. He says, see how many stars there are? That's how many seed you're going to have. And verse 6, Abraham, it says, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So shortly after that, in chapter 17, God makes, uh, uh, he basically restates the covenant uh, that he made with him. Chapter 15 verse 18 says the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Uh, that's after <clears throat> he told Abraham to uh, to uh, make the sacrifice with all the animals and he gives them the vision of the burning lamp going between the pieces and that blood sacrifice uh, sealed the covenant that God made with Abraham. Uh, but he says, uh, you know, in the same day God made a covenant with Abram saying unto thy seed have I given this land. Well here in chapter 17 he restates the covenant. Uh, verse 7 of chapter 17, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and thy seed after thee and I will give unto thee and thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger all the land of Canaan what for an everlasting possession and I will be their God see to have something as an everlasting possession you have to live forever you can't possess something forever if you're not alive possessing it. So it's your possession forever if you live forever. This is a promise to Abraham of eternal life. And then verse 11, and ye shall, uh, excuse me, let's pick up in um, verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised and ye, ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt um, me and you. So there's this covenant that God makes with Abraham, and it's the covenant of circumcision. Hold your place there, if you would, and go back to Romans chapter 6. It's this, what we read about in Colossians 2, it has to do with being identified with Christ. Ultimately, we find out again after the cross, through progressive revelation, what that circumcision that, he, that is the sign of the covenant he makes with Abraham, that unconditional covenant to give him the land, eternal life in the land forever, God's looking forward to the cross. 
and how he's going to identify Abraham and his believing seed with the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans 6 verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death, therefore were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Um, look at um, verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So in our walk as believers today, we're to see ourselves the, the way God sees us as being made righteous in Christ. We're to walk by faith in that righteousness God has made us in his Son. It's not us walking trying to muster our own righteousness up. It's our walking by faith in the righteousness God has made us, Christ's righteousness. We're to walk in his righteousness by faith. We're to live like a righteous person would live because he's made us righteous in his son. That's who he sees us as the righteous, uh, justified saint that he's made us in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So... Being identified together in his death, burial, and res resurrection is how God cut away our uh, sinful flesh from our spiritual nature. God forgave us of all of our sins and made us righteous in Christ. God indwells our spirit and we have Christ's eternal life. In uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 3, Paul makes reference to this. We see the reference to circumcision in 2 Corinthians 3, 3. So, in Colossians 2, Paul uses, in further revelation, in Colossians 2, he reveals to us that being identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection is being circumcised with the circumcision that's made without hands. 2 Corinthians 3.3 3, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. And such trust have we through uh, Christ to Godward, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think, of any, or think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So, we're, in this passage, Paul reveals to us that this identification with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection is how God made us righteous by writing the law in our hearts. We're the testimony of God. He's written with the Holy Spirit indwelling us, and that Spirit revealing that we're or making us righteous in Christ, giving us fleshly tables of our heart, allowing us to trust in God's Word and walk by faith in God's Word, take the spiritual words of God's book, God's Spirit leading us, able to access by faith the truth of God's Word, who and what He's made us, and the Word of God effectually work in us when we believe it. That's fleshly tables of heart. It's God motivating us to, out of love, serve Him, out of, of love and gratitude. We're able to walk by faith in who and what God's given us because of His grace and mercy, and respond to God with the desire to serve Him. But in truth, God has made us in Christ identified us with Christ, and we are made righteous through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're given Christ's perfect righteousness, and that's how God is able to indwell our spiritual nature, isn't it? God couldn't indwell us with our sinful flesh. He's not indwelling our, the, our sin nature. He's indwelling our spiritual nature. There's a way that the Word of God, God is able to use His Word and faith in His Word to effectually work in us when we believe it, and that's what happened to us um, like in Hebrews chapter 4, when we trusted the gospel. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says, For the word of God is quick, it's alive, it's powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, that's the body, 
and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You notice circumcision of the heart, of the heart, of the heart, gives us a fleshly heart. That has to do with the mind of faith. That has to do with the function of our soul, is when we believe the Word of God, when we put our trust in God's Word, God the Holy Spirit, uh, sees our faith in his word and makes us righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. He circumcises our heart and God the Holy Spirit leads us in an understanding and faith application of God's word in our walk as believers to by faith believe that God has cut away our sin nature from our spirit, our, in, our inner man. And we're to access by faith in our inner man the righteousness God has made us in his son.